The Richard M. Dorsen Lecture is a series is held every spring in honor of Richard M. Dorsen. Dorsen is credited with establishing folklore studies as an academic discipline in the United States. Professor Dorsen directed the Ivy Folklore Institute for many years, beginning in 1956. He later chaired the folklore department until his death in 1981. We are grateful for our founding donors, Dr. Sandra Dolby, Dr. Bill Ivey, Dr. Michael Owen Jones, and our anonymous donors. Today we are honored to welcome Dr. Terry Gunnell, a professor of folkloristics at the University of Iceland. My dear colleague, Barbara Hillers, will introduce Dr. Gunnell. It is now my pleasure to briefly introduce her. <laughs> <laughs> storytelling, folklore and gender, the history of folkloristics, archives, and the dark side of the internet. Before coming to Bloomington, she taught at Edinburgh University, Harvard, and most recently at the University, University College of Dublin. Her research focuses on oral narrative and song, and the interface between oral and written literature in Iceland and Scotland. Welcome. and collaborators. 
reflector in all those countries, no perigamo and vice versa. That is uh, a huge achievement. Um, so for most of us, Iceland, his adopted home country, is Sagaland, right? And that was brought home to me when my colleague Fernando Morejuela, when I introduced him to Terry and Fernando launched into discussing Neil Saga <laughs> with, with Terry. And uh, Terry Gunn has certainly paid his due to uh, sa Old Norse Saga literature and specifically the Eddic mythological parts of the Saga literature um, in many articles and book chapters. Um, and as well in 2013, he co edited a volume on the Nordic apocalypse. The, approaches to the Wallace Spark. Um, so he has paid um, his view to Sagaland, but I wanted to just mention three areas which Terry has really made his own. Um, the first one is, of course, Scandinavian folk drama, masking and mumming, and that's how probably many of us know him in that context, particularly of those of us who like Irish mumming. Uh, so not only was his PhD uh, on the origins of Scandinavian drama, um, but he published his book, The Origins of Drama in Scandinavia in 1995, and edited a, a very important uh, volume on masks and mumming in the Nordic area in 2007. The second area is legend studies. The legend has um, always been the stepchild. Well, it is a stepchild no longer, certainly not in the North, in Northwestern Europe. Uh, partly, I really think, uh, due to the work Terry Gunnell has done. Um, so he edited a wonderful book on legends and landscape in uh, 2008, and one of the brilliant and innovative uh, things I'm deeply grateful for is his um, use of um, computer mapping to make the legends come to life. And it's known as a Sagna Bruna um, project, and you can find it, sagnabruna.com. Um, and which really brings, enables us to put together text and photos and contextual material in a, in a really futuristic dream come true. Uh, his most recent project, the Grim Ripples project, Grim was two M's, so you get the illusion, um, brings together his interest in legend studies and another interest, which is in the 19th century into Icelandic intellectuals uh, that, um, to whom we owe those legends and other stories, figures such as Jon Arneson, uh, Markus Grimson, uh, Sigurd and Gudmundsson, and it is that, that book about that was nominated only, but should have been rewarded the Islam Prize in 2017. Um, the Grim Ribbons project, and the book is due um, to come out later this year. This person. Cool. Um, so uh, it shows how that neglected collection of the Grimms, not the Kinder and Hausmärchen, but the Deutsche Sagen, had actually, at least initially, a much more significant impact in the Scandinavian countries in particular. And uh, what I think is brilliant about that project, not only that it foregrounds uh, legend studies and the growth of legend studies in within the context of cultural nationalism, but the way Terry managed to bring a very distinguished set of scholars together. So this time
kind of internationalism to me um, is what Kerry is all about. Um, you know, not just showing poor Icelandic material, the masking and mumming, but getting scholars and archivists all over Scandinavia to do the same thing in their countries and then make it an international enterprise. Okay. Tasting some local wine as one does and 
eating some roasted suckling pig, as one does, we then visited the headquarters of the cultural association that runs the oldest of the masking groups in the village, Pro Loco. Here we examined the costumes and other related artifacts and recorded interviews with two long-term participants, Gionino Bugioni, who was the earlier president of the association, and then Bastiano Cano, who's been a mamatone from the age of seven, and with the other trustee Veronica serving as a translator. Several days later, the university arranged for me to publicly interview another long-term participant, the bus driver Jesuino Greg, who has been also carrying out his research into the traditions. And a postgraduate student at the University of Luca Vincius has since, since been translating the interviews for me and helped with gathering additional material. Endless letters have been going back and forth over the last few months. I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks to all of these people for their patience, especially with me, and their support. But what, though, is so interesting about these particular traditions and why should I think I have anything useful to say about them? Now, one thing that's immediately striking to me when I got there was the fact that until very recently, hardly anything seemed to have been written about these customs that was not in Italian, meaning that in academic terms, they tended to be very much an in-house matter, which is very much like many of the guising traditions that we find all over Northern Europe, it's the local people who write about them rather than outsiders. The main exceptions were these articles, the latter three of which I only came across about two weeks ago by accident. In a moment, I'll show you a short film which should give you a good introduction to the traditions in question and exactly what they involve. And as you see here, there are numerous, to my mind, intriguing parallels to be found with the kinds of tradition that I've been researching in Northern Europe with others. And these suggest that there's good reason to consider these traditions in a much wider context than just that of the Mediterranean, and not least when it comes to questions relating to the function, the role, the behavior, and the experience. Cultural background is, of course, another matter. As I'll show, in recent years, both the meaning and the nature of these traditions have been changing in various degrees, both as a result of touristic in interest and under the influence of various kinds of international cooperation. This means that there's good reason, I think, for all of us who've been working with such traditions to compare notes drawing on the range of different viewpoints that have come about with regard to mumming traditions over time, but to partly as a result of the different circumstances that surround each particular tradition. Indeed, this can hopefully offer a few new, fresh insights for all of us about the nature and the role of all kinds of tradition, past and present. But the brief film I showed a moment involving both sound and vision shows, I think, better than any words what exactly is going on in this little village in the present time. The setting is high up in the mountains of Barbagia in central Sardinia, an area once closely associated with bandits and kidnapping and feuding. And here we have without question an area that has preserved all the traditions for a long time. A bit like Sjetersdal in West Southern Norway, what Bengta Klintberg has called a relict or corner, a place that keeps relics. And it's one of the few areas in the island where Sardinian, rather than Italian, is still spoken in local dialects on a daily basis. Now, uh, Mamayada has little more than about 2,500 inhabitants, a figure that's changed actually very little over the last 100 years. As you watch the film, note the word Sardinia in the bottom right-hand corner, and we'll come back to what that implies later on. So let's see. Three minutes.
It gives you some sort of sense of exactly what I'll be talking about here. Now, as you saw in the film, the heart of the tradition is closely connected with bonfires and the 17th of January, the day of St. Monia de Sua. St. Anthony the Abbot, also known as St. Anthony the Great, who, according to local legend, stole fire from hell with the help of a pig. And yeah, I know about that. It's very, very odd. It involves not only one, but two types of what some call geysers and other mummers, others mummers, in other words, masked figures. The mummatongas are easily recognizable. In addition to their hand-carved black masks, or visera, made of wild pear wood, their inverse sheepskin coats, like those worn the right way around in the past by shepherds, and then the dark velvet tunics that they wear beneath these. They also wear hand-tanned hand leather shoes and a black Sardinian copper or beret, over which they have a woman's headscarf. Strapped tightly around them are around 25 to 30 plus kilos of brass bells with bone clappers, which are referred to as salcaragia, meaning the load or the burden. Not only restricting breathing by up to 50%, these regularly leave bruises behind on those who bear them. As you saw in the film, these figures do not say a single word and pay no attention to their audiences. Lined up in two rows, they have a carefully synchronized movement, twisting and jumping in time, alternately to the left and the right, accompanied by this rhythmic stamping of their feet and the clamor of the bells. The occasional triple jump they make is conducted by one of the so-called Isuatoris, who has the role of leader. Now the Isuatoris themselves, who walk beside them and in front of them and behind the Mamatoris, are very different in terms of costume, character, and then interaction with those watching. As you'll hear later on, their costumes, the one that's changed most probably over time. Referred to as Turkish clothing, it also includes a black, the black Sardinian berry, along with this colored neckerchief tied around the neck, baggy trousers, a white linen shirt, a pair of black woolen gut gaiters, and a traditional red jacket. Over the shoulder runs a belt made of leather and fabric with small bells attached to it, and around the waist is a black, is a dark colored embroidered shawl which hangs over the left leg. In recent years, one of the two Mamatonis groups, Pro Loco, has also taken up the use of this white, plain, visera clara mask known as Santo or Santa or Olympia, which means simply clean. This has replaced the use of a white cloth or handkerchief, which is apparently a, a revival of an earlier tradition, they say. The key piece of equipment, though, for the Isuatoris, however, is their lasso, or their solha, which is used to ensnare members of the public, and, of course, particularly women, who have then to either give them a kiss or a drink of wine to be released. Now, in its present form, this procession itself would have been classified by Herbert Halpert under the heading of um, a formal outdoor movement, rather than the kind of house visiting usually encountered as part of a large number of Nordic, Germanic, Irish, and Scottish geyser traditions. Tom Pettit would thus have referred to it as an excursion rather than an incursion into houses, something that takes place outdoors in the street, involving both, uh, both convivial and mischievous interactions as part of what must be regarded as a kind of encounter between two groups, the participants and then the audience and something which, in the case of the Isuatoris at least, does involve some kind of interaction or some, some kind of exaction um, from, the, or from the watchers. And I'll come back to the gender aspects of the tradition a little bit later on. Now, in terms of timing, as I mentioned earlier on, the tradition in, this, in its most genuine form, as people see it, does take place on the 17th of January, following on from other customs that take place the night before eve of St. Anthony. According to one of the more recent researchers, Rita Mele, on the 16th, local people go out to collect dry branches, tree roots, and especially logs of oak, which are then used to build bonfires in different parts of the town. In the late afternoon, 
A priest then leads women and children clockwise three times around the main bonfire that's been built outside the central church of Beata Virginia Assunta, the Blessed Virgin Mary of the Assumption, the patron saint of the town, followed then by the image of St. Anthony, which is kept in the church. After this, the central bonfire has been lit. Fire from that is taken away to light all of the other 30 to 40 bonfires that have been built all around the village, a sort of need fire idea as we get in some places of Scotland and Ireland, I think. All of which have become, they all become the center of various social gatherings, accompanied, of course, by local wine, sweets, and cookies. The fires are then kept burning all night prior to the visits that take place the following afternoon from these two groups of mamatones and the Isuatoris. Now, as I just noted, nowadays there isn't just one, but two mamatones processions that take place simultaneously on the 17th, both starting at the aforementioned church, before then separating to run through the upper and the lower parts of the town. These processions are then in the hands of the two cultural associations, Pro Loco and Arsene Becco, both of which are based in their walled headquarters, roughly very much in the center of the town. And annually, they alternate with who takes which part of the town on the 17th. Now, I might add that the headquarters, where the costumes are all carefully stored with a great deal of respect, are largely closed to outsiders. There's a certain holiness about them, which is beginning to change a little bit. It is, as a yes, changing in the last couple of years or so. But with regard to the names of the two groups, each of which has now got over 200 members, that of the older original Pro Loco, literally meaning in favor of the local community, it's a name that's, communal, that's commonly used in Italy by various local associations engaged in community support. At Senebacoi, the second group, came into being in around 1975 and is named after two of the main organizers. And I'll say more about the origin of these two groups later on. Now, as mentioned earlier, the custom itself starts with the donning of, cost of the costumes in the early afternoon of the 17th. It's something that's traditionally taken place away from public view within the respective headquarters and is evidently taken extremely seriously by all of those involved. The seriousness is seen in the way that the donning of skins and bells and masks is regularly described in both the written sources and the words of the participants themselves. Giannino Puccioni sees it as the peak, peak moment after a previous period of what he sees as being psychological truth tuning. Mario Puffy, who runs the museum, describes it as an abandonment of personal identity, a ritual metamorphosis or transformation. Rita Miller talks of it in terms of a symbolic transmutation through a solemn ritual at once sacred and profane. Giacino Grego, meanwhile, talks about a form of regeneration going on. And the commentary of the introductory film shown in the local museum reflects the same idea, underlining that a mamatone or of mamayada is not an individual nor a character. He doesn't belong to carnival figures nor to the comedy of art. Behind the mask, there's no face waiting to be revealed no physiognomy, no personality of a person being given. A total loss of identity occurs. One lives the experience of metamorphosis. The masquerade absorbs one into, one's, into itself. And the putting on of the masquerade for the first time is a sacred rite, and the experience is one of radical mutation. Uh, Giannino Puccioni told me, when the mask is put on the face, Everything changes for the master man. There's a completely different world that appears in front of you. An emotion, an engagement. The Mamatoni now sees the world in a completely different way. He feels powerful, important, but also responsible. He has interior strength, inner forces, capable of leaving all fears behind. He can see the world from a different dimension. Now what's clear is that for those involved, even today, the main tradition on the 17th of January is much closer to ritual than play if we consider Richard Schechner's performance scale. It's something enforced by attitudes 
to the handmade masks, which are made or adapted to fit the face exactly, and then passed down within the family as members of the younger generation take on the roles earlier performed by their parents and their grandparents. Indeed, some of these masks used in the procession are now over 40 years old. Jesuino Grego, who has been an Isidore for much of his life, says that he sees his white mask as a sacred object. It's something he keeps in a special box at home. Yes, he can show it to other people, he can let them touch it, but he'll never, ever let them put it on. And then, of course, we have the physical effect of strapping on the bells, which takes place around two in the afternoon, and apparently needs the assistance of two experienced Isidore's helpers who aim to avoid the wearer suffering any lasting physical harm over the course of the ritual. The earlier these bells weigh between 25 and 30 kilos in total, the straps contorting the body, pulling down the back and the spine, as I say, regularly leaving bruising behind them. Like the mask, worn for several hours, they underline the fact that what we're looking at here involves a particular act of endurance, that's not for the faint-hearted in any way, or the unfit. I can see very clear parallels to other customs, like uh, centering around endurance, like that of the Burry Man in Queensbury, near Edinburgh, in which the central performer is clad for a day in a day-long procession in sticky, stinging birds, and it's very, very hot inside there. Often collapses too. Now, with regard to the roots taken through the upper and the lower town by the different groups after they left the church in January, these evidently vary and are essentially in the hands of the leading Isuatoris, who have the main aim of visiting all of the bonfires in the town. The route through the older upper town, taken later when the Mamatonis returned during the carnival period, the Shrove Tuesday and the previous Sunday, is nonetheless more decided, partly based on earlier tradition, but partly now on the need to accommodate tourists. After emerging from their headquarters, the performers, now numbering about 30 to 35 from both groups, start by going to the Bar Nele, or the wine cellar Cantina Erminus, which is marked on the map here, for some initial liquid lubrication. The formal procession of silent Mabatonis, flanked by the Isoatoris with their lassos, then slowly moves down the main roads of the Via Vittorio Emanuela and the Corso Vittorio Emanuela. And when they reach the main bonfire in the square, in the, in the front of the Chiesa Santa Croce Church, they then circle the bonfire three times anti-clockwise before engaging in a traditional Sardinian circular dance. And the procession then moves up again, now going up to, the, to another bar before returning to end in the central square. No other stops are taken on the way. As we can see from this description, and as Monica, Iorio, and Jeffrey Wall have noted in their recent article, there is little question that tr the tradition in its present form has developed in various ways over time. In addition to the development of the two groups and the additional appearances that are now taking place at Shrovetide, especially for outsiders, a number of other changes have taken place in what seems to be, to what seems to have been the core of the tradition. According to the director of the museum, Mario Puffy, way back in the past, this tradition was something that took place around Halloween, at the beginning of the winter, rather than at the end of the winter where it takes place now. And it used to involve the visiting of individual houses, much like um, one encounters, as I say, in Northern Europe, traditions past and present. Now, whether that's true or not, the idea of the Mamatonis blessing the village and its inhabitants is clearly reflected in just Giacino uh, Gregor's statement that on the 17th of January, once masked and dressed, the Mamatonis do their very best to make sure that they visit, and as he puts it, honor every neighborhood in the village dancing close to all of the bonfires, where they're given wine and especially homemade cookies. As Gregor stressed, their appearance was considered by the whole community to be a propitiatory moment, people feeling personally offended in some way if the procession happens to miss out on any site. 
a feature, of course, one regularly encounters with regard to Nordic and North Atlantic customs. And as both Jessino Grego and Giolino Puggioni stress, while the basic features of the tradition were largely the same back in the 50s and the 60s after the war, when the community was particularly poverty-stricken, both the masks and the costumes were commonly more often much more basic in form. At that time, it was known for some of the Mamatones to simply wear inside-out velvet jackets, their bells taken from local herds, then being rougher and less deliberately harmonious than they are today. Well, the masks, if they were worn at all, were often both heavier and somewhat tougher and rougher. Indeed, some people would just blacken their faces with soot, while the Isuatoris, as I noted earlier, would often just use a piece of cloth or white cloth or a handkerchief with holes in it for the eyes. Common shirts being cut and then changed to form a bodice of some kind, somewhat like you can see in this image up here on the top. But what the guesswork is made about the ancient origins of the tradition, it is evident that the festival of St. Anthony, a key time of change for both the herders and farmers, has long been the time of the main procession, just as it is in the case of similar long-standing traditions found in two other nearby villages of Otana and then Oratelli. And in all of these cases, however, the maskers also nowadays make appearances at Shrovetide as part of Carnival. This is in addition to the increasing number of appearances at other masking parades that now take place all over Sardinia and abroad, a development I'll come back to in just a minute. And as you'll see, just as you saw just now, the traditions that take place in Otana and Oratelli are clearly closely related and involve very similar features all centering around these masked figures and skins, and in Tana, not only horned beings, but also an intriguing female figure known as the Philomzona, or the spinner. In both cases, those involved go out of their way to stress the ancient roots of what they're doing, something that was naturally taken up by most of the early Scandinavian scholars of these traditions when they started getting involved in the 1950s, following the initial work local scholar called Raffaello Masci, who came from the local center of Noaro. Now, many people like to point to the potential connections to the festival of Dionysus and the Saturnalia, Franco Stefano Rio, suggesting that the tradition originated in the Mycenaean, with the Mycenaean and Greek migrations. The word Mamatone coming from the ancient Greek word Maimaia or Manolis, meaning the possessed crazy or the wild. Real points to also other potential connections between the place Mamayada and the place name Maimone, which is apparently also has several Dionysian associations and is often given to places with natural springs. Yet others have suggested that the name of the tradition comes from another word, which is Momote, Momoto, meaning death. But with regard to the tradition itself, some scholars propose links to the local Bronze Age Nuagic culture found all over the island, which is certainly left behind evidence of reverence of wells. But lacking any solid evidence for such links, some academics have pointed to even a 6th century letter from Pope Gregory, which complains about the enduring pagan traditions and beliefs of the barbaric people of this area, who are said to live like animals, whatever that means. But in association with such ideas, we do regularly also encounter a range of statements about probable connections to fertility and the cycle of life. As Greg was stated in the public interview I took with him, in the end, I believe that the ritual represents the natural cycle of life. And we shouldn't look at the parade now, we should look at it as it was supposed to be in the past. Why did the elders taking on the role of the Mamatone carry all of that weight around while the young Isuatores were so light, showing their skillfulness? Why? In my opinion, that's the starting point, the end and the beginning of everything. It's nature, man itself. And when it comes down to it, bearing in mind the lack of solid evidence, such suppositions, when, when it comes down to it, can naturally never be more than suppositions. And a key problem is that while very similar traditions can be found on the Greek island Skiados in the Sporades. 
There are simply no early written records from the Garbaccia area, or even written by visitors to it, documenting the existence of such costumes in earlier times. Everything in this area was passed on orally. The earliest memories on record just going back to the late 19th century. The earliest mask that we have dates back to the early 19th century. To my mind, though, as I noted earlier, there would seem to be little question that the traditions follow the same pattern as we find in Northern Europe and the Alps in their general association with the beginning and the ending of the winter season, and not least their intriguing connections with a female rather than a male figure, even though those taking part are all male. Throughout the North, we encounter regular associations between winter guising and horned bestial female figures, such as Grilla in Iceland, the Pharaohs in Shetland, Lucy and the Christmas goat, or the Ulegeit in Norway. And then, of course, we have the Krampus and the Pechten in Austria, all of whom are traditionally acted by men. Other parallels can be found in the Kayak, or the Old Woman, who symbolizes winter in Ireland. And then we have Gurarisa, or Gudrun, the horse tail, who's supposed to lead the wintry wild ride in the mountains of western Norway. In the case of Mamiyada, one notes this strange use by the Manatomis of the female headscarf, the vestiges of a skirt on the Isoatoris. And then we have this aforementioned central female filonzona or spinner with her distaff and, and her scissors. In short, while becoming a member of the Mamatomis is a particularly macho matter, then we find, for example, Gregor suggesting that the matriarchal element has always been, to his mind, very important in Sardinia, and something that can also be found in the archaeological remains from the Bronze Age. But whatever the case, there would seem to be remnants of something older and shared across a very wide area of territory, although how they got here, for example, from the Alps, or vice versa, is of course open to all sorts of questions. But two other aspects worth bearing in mind, though, in connection with the nature of the more recent ritual are the relationship that they have with the nobility of the area and the church, both of which have found themselves in various kinds of conflict with masking traditions elsewhere. Now, with regard to the former, in other words, the nobility, Gregor points to a member of the nobility called Don Raimondo Meloni, who in the early years of the 20th century not only had the role of an Isoatore, but also regularly allowed the group to come and dress up in his closed courtyard. Now, while he might have had a name for the higher quality of his rather snazzy clothing, and not least his golden buttons, he evidently recognized the importance of this tradition in which not only identity, but of course all differences between classes naturally disappeared. The relationship with the church was evidently somewhat more problematic. Apparently, according to Gregor, in earlier times, the bonfire processions with the statue of the saint that had ended earlier also used to go round on the 17th of January. In other words, on the same day as the Mamatonis processions, something which on one occasion resulted in the two processions bumping into each other. As a result of this, the church decided they were going to move their day of the procession Back to, the previous, back to the previous day, thereby avoiding any direct connections with these Mamatonis figures. But particularly revealing about the village dynamics with regard to the tradition is a story told to me by Gregor by his uncle, told to Gregor by his uncle, another Isoatore, about how on one occasion, when a priest happened to be out and about at the time of the Mamatonis procession, he suddenly found himself being lassoed by one of the Isoatores. And he reacted promptly by cutting the lasso with a knife. The reaction from the group was apparently electrifying. Everything went totally silent. And the entire area just stopped. Everything stopped. The situation had to be speedily resolved by, a, by the local authorities. The priest named Gasperi, who appears to have come from outside Sardinia, was then taken to one side and formally reprimanded for his behavior by the aforementioned Don Meloni and the local mayor, another member of the nobility called Don Murcia. Clearly, when it came down to it, the sanctity of the local tradition and its objects was much more important for the community than the essentially foreign church. 
The compromise arrived at led to the development of the tradition I noted earlier, whereby the Mamatonis procession now began with them circling the fire outside the church in the same space in which the statue of the saint had been carried around the previous night. Indeed, according to Bastiano and Giannino, nowadays the priests even offer the mummers a glass of red wine, so there's a mixing, but the priests are becoming much more local than they were in the past. But interesting as these matters are, I'm going to leave these interesting transgender, religious, class discussions to one side for now, because it's not so much the ancient roots and the beliefs that I was most struck by, as much as by other questions relating to the present and the future, and not least the potential conflict that's currently taking place between the local and the national with regard to the various types of Mamatone performance that a visitor is presently faced with as part of Scandinavian culture. As I've been stressing here both, and as Joris and Wall have noted in their valuable work, the Mamatone traditions of the past were essentially something that was solely for the village and for its inhabitants. Things have now clearly changed. Indeed, anyone who visits the capital of Cagliari nowadays, several hours drive away from the village, is likely to come face to face with numerous souvenir shops filled with little mamatonis figures and miniature and full-size masks. And you then go on to the airport, and just across from copies of the Bronze Age neuralgic figures and statues is a full-size mamatonis figure standing outside the main souvenir shop. Step inside, you can even pick yourself up a Mamatonis t-shirt to take home with you, or even a miniature Mamatonis bell. Check out the brochure for the island as a whole, and what do we find on the cover but a photograph of one of the horned figures from Atana standing in front of a Christian chapel, accompanied by a headline underlining the cultural move from nature to civilization. In other words, the move from the ethnic to the natural, uh, from the to, from the ethnic and the natural to the universal and the bricked. And these days, dominated by this spiky red beastie, you can, of course, even get yourselves a Mamatonic Corbin mask. Now, this development is, of course, interesting in a number of ways. On one level, it's very reminiscent of the examples from Japan that Michael Dylan Foster's pointed out of certain local masking traditions being granted UNESCO status while others are put to one side. One perhaps could say the same with regard to the Native American artifacts one encounters all over the place in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, where I'm teaching this term. In Sardinia, however, I think things have gone much further, as it's clear that the rural local is once again becoming the urban national, something that, of course, was regularly encountered if we go back to the publications of various kinds of folk tales during the national romantic period of the 19th century that we're examining in our Green Ripples project. In short, we're faced with questions of ownership and heritage, much like the other case studies that my colleague, Voldemar Hafstein, has been focusing on. And in the interviews I took in 2018, like Monica Yoro and Geoffrey Wall, I was struck by the various ways in which the local Mama Yada seem to be dealing with this development when it asks them about the potential effects it's having on the intrinsic nature, the dynamics of their traditions. From my own personal side, I was also intrigued by the large range of different performances that seem to be taking place simultaneously as the Mamatones take to the streets on January the 17th. Performances that involve well, it's a very subtle cultural juggling act. It's logical to start by giving a brief introduction to the background of this particular development, explaining why the focus came to be on the Mamatonis rather than on other groups in this particular area. Arguably, things started changing in the 1950s with the appearance of Raffaello's article La Maschera Barbacone, published in Il Ponto, and then various publications by the anthropologist Franco Cagnetti, which were based on his field research in the bandit communities of nearby Orcasolo. And it was the latter work that led to the arrival in the area of the Italian photographer Pablo Volta in 1954, and the resulting black and white photographs of the Mamma Yaga Mamma Torres that he took in 1957, 
images that attracted international attention when they were published in the next foreign edition of Garnetta's books. But the Pro Loco Association had been set up around this time in, and in 1955, a regional institution for tourism invited them to send a group to take part in another traditional event known as the Cavalcata Sarda, or the Sardinian Horse Ride, which takes place every year in Sassari in northern Sardinia, something that was starting to take on the form of a more generalized procession of Sardinian traditional dress. Yet another step was taken in 1974, when the Mamatones were invited to perform as part of the opening ceremony of the European Championships of Athletics in the Olympic Stadium in Rome. Now, perform is the key word here, since now the group was on show to the world as representatives not only of Sardinia, but actually even of ancient Italy as a whole. And for most observers here, the idea of the village Mamatones was clearly being replaced by something completely different. But this development of being asked to perform outside of town, both in Sardinia and abroad, continued over the next decades, something that naturally brought ever more outside attention to the custom and ever more tourists to the village in search of the real thing. Pro local participants talk about visits to Sligo in Ireland in 2006, where they joined forces with the Irish straw boys and mummers as part of a procession through town. Other trips were taken to Cuba and then to the Milan Expo in 2015. And in 2018, the group was even invited to go to Singapore to take part in an international food festival. Members of the other Mamatonis group have meanwhile tra traveled to Germany, France, England, Spain, Turkey, the Czech Republic. One of the immediate results of these developments in the mid-70s was the formal establishment of the Pro Loco Association and then that of the second Mamatones group, the Asocione Culturale Azene Becoi, by one of the leading, which was set up by one of the leading Isatura performers, Constantino Azene. Now the arrival of this second group, sorry, it's a here he is. The arrival of the second group was apparently not the result of any enmity or competition, or even a direct follow-up to the expansion of the town, something that actually commonly happens in masking traditions. As the town grows, it suddenly splits like an amoeba. But that didn't happen in this case. It seems to have taken place largely as a, as a means of taking the weight off the pro-local group with regard to the increasing demands for them to perform. It also allowed more men to participate, gave some necessary assistance with regard to reaching all of those bonfires in the same evening in different areas of town. And certainly in this period, there does appear to have been a clash between the younger and older generations of participants, stemming from the feeling that there was now a need for a greater degree of organization in order to meet the amount of attention that was coming from outside. It seems to have been such pressure that led to the establishment of the two associations, which then continued to work quite effectively together. Note the fact that they now also have websites designed for the outside world, one of them already in English. And they also, one of them has this nice slot where it's possible to make bookings for shows. Now the next key development though, following the increasing interest of anthropologists in the 1980s, was the, uh, was the active collaboration of the two associations in the establishment of the Museum of Mediterranean Mumming in Mamayada in 2002. An institution run as a local cooperative, the museum has the aim of not only giving some depth to the Mamatones traditions for visitors, but also of introducing the other older traditions of this area of Nuoro, of Nuoro and then placing them within the wider Mediterranean context. The museum also has the role of providing a safe home for the older masks as, they, as people get older. Initially paid for by both the municipality and the Italian government, there can be little question about the overall success of this place. According to Yoro and Wall, before the arrival of COVID, this museum was getting an average of 10,000 visitors a year, and as many as 17,500 in 2012. 
a figure that gives some idea of the number of people that are nowadays flocking to Mama Yaga to see the processions, and especially those that take place, as I say, at Shrove time, a bit later on. A further step of internationalization can be said to have been taken when the museum itself went on to actively participate in the European I Am Mask project, project on museums and in intangible cultural heritage, a focus on European masking traditions, which was initiated by the International Carnival and Mask Museum in Bidjeshire, Belgium. Funded by the European Union and by UNESCO, that project led to a series of lectures and seminars and the publication of these books in the series here. But interestingly enough, the project centered around the very relevant question of what happened to the heritage called oral and intangible recognized by UNESCO. Now, as noted earlier, the development I've described here has gone on to result in the Mamatonis mask seemingly becoming a national symbol for Sardinia, a key feature in all souvenir shops around Cagliari. One could thus argue that the Mamatone, in some ways, is becoming, being turned into a kind of stuffed national mannequin available to be rolled out into any kind of surroundings. Alongside this, we suddenly find numerous other villages in the area, noting the financial gains that have been provided for Mama Yada. They've also started following suit by rediscovering their own versions of all the traditions of Mama Yada and Otana and Oratelli. As the director of the museum, Mario Papi writes, during carnival, even in the summer, it's not unusual to find a number of costume parades taking place throughout Barbagia and the surrounding villages all through the season so that the greatest number of visitors can get a chance to see them. The phenomenon does act as a sort of showcase for folk heritage, but out of context, it somehow comes down to being a series of senseless exhibitions. The formal renewed emphasis on tradition gives rise to remodeled events that can easily become just performance shows, as much as they aren't directly steeped in any form of genuine local tradition. As Mario adds, these Barbagia carnivals appear like a sort of tormented attempt to fit in at all costs with the new society, to jump on the bandwagon of history, the unswerving need to stand for one's identity that only pervades through its anchoring in an outdated culture. What is today's significance and the importance of the carnival in the eyes of the Barbagian people? Is this custom actually still alive and meaningful? It's worth considering what the participants from Mamayada have to say about this. As Yoro and Wall have noted, there can be little question about the huge economic benefits that this development has had on an isolated area that was previously suffering in all sorts of ways. But as I say, at the same time, there is a feeling that the right has become staged and its attendance turned into a liminal experience more than a sacred, intimate one, especially for the youngsters. Pablo Volta, when he returned to the village in 1981 and 2008, reached a similar conclusion. But now the protagonists of the right are the tourists. And the right, once uh, appropriator of a goods harvest, now appropriates the tourist season. Jasmino Gregor says that he, like others, is actually well aware of this problem. To his mind, we have been coming out far too much lately, and I think the time has come to rein back and straighten out and attend only relevant parades that are really worth attending and stay more at home. At first we went halfway around the world, and I guess it was positive, because today we're well known and the mask is representative of Sardinia to the world. However, I think we must go back and stay more at home. When you go out and parade, it should be something mean meaningful and targeted. It must be really worth it. We should just go to every little country festival. It's not good. And then he adds, this is a ritual. We must act accordingly. We can't trivialize, trivialize it. We work so hard to enhance it. And now it's true, we have been trivializing it a bit too much recently. Mario Parfi, the director of the museum, expresses similar sentiments. What matters, he says, is that it doesn't become something only for touristic purposes. And he adds, though, he's feeling that here, in Mamayada, there isn't that danger. But it's dangerous in other places. Because they're trying to revive the kind of things 
where it's not cared for, it's no longer felt, just in order to attract people. They have the UNESCO idea, but that requires a form of standardization. And note the way that Papa draws a line here between Mama Yada and these other villages with their carnival parades that he feels are trying to jump on the bandwagon of history. And in this context, he also underlines the way in which in Mama Yada, the cultural associations are now being particularly careful to rein in any attempt by younger people to emphasize the devilish aspects, to make the event more grotesque. Note the stress, too, that Pafi, like Gregor, places on the difference between the carnival processions on one side and then those that occur at San Antonio, and the clear wariness he seems to have of the so-called blessings of UNESCO. Gregor also underlines what he feels as being a key difference between the San Antonio ritual and the carnival play, the difference that exists between performing elsewhere and then performing at home. It was a very strong ritual, for sure. That's why it's been preserved, he says. In my opinion, it's not about carnival masks, because the real ritual, the real ritual takes place on San Antonio's day in January. And if you want to get goose flesh, you should come on San Antonio's day. And he adds, if I parade in Cagliari, it has one meaning. In Mamayada, it has another one. You can't even try and compare these two things. Now, the continuing deep feelings that the local people have about San Antonio are reflected also in the words of Giannino Pagioni that if this procession and if this tradition ceased, what exactly would happen to the community? It would be a great loss. Local people always, always do their best in order not to miss the parade. Any kind of effort is made in order to take part in this procession, despite the bad weather conditions or personal happenings like bereavements and marriage and so forth. People do feel morally obliged to be present for the occasion. And indeed the stress that Puccione and Gregor place on ritual and local community and local connection is also seen in the fact that while children are now being allowed to dress up on certain occasions as Mamadonis, and while the maskers, as you saw before, may now occasionally reveal their identity, there is still an emphasis, particularly in the pro-local group, of all the Mamatonis participants have to come from the village. The participation of children being seen really as a form of learning, and even a sort of week to passage. All in all, with regard to the question of whether the procession of the Mamatonis has lost its meaning, for the local people, with the advent of tourism and the adoption of the mask as a national symbol, I agree with the conclusion of Yoro and all that Despite the increased tourist audience in San Antonio, it would be wrong to assume that the meaning implicit to the, uh, to the right has actually now been wiped out. For the local people, the event does remain a moment to receive blessings for the communities and the individual's prosperity. It also continues to be a ludic moment for the locals, which reinforces social relations and place attachment. In short, to the minds of Yoro and Wall, tradition and tourism has enabled the San Antonio Festival to bring together and protect a traditional cultural expression, while at the same time addressing the need for economic development in a way that's allowed Mamayada to open itself up to the rest of the world after so many years of isolation, marginality, and poverty. As they add, we believe that the Mamayada people are using their culture no matter what, whether commodified or not, as a way of affirming their identity and telling their own story, which brings them pride and a positive attitude to the future, and also builds, uh, builds empowerment. I think pride is the key word here, something seen in the way that the recognition of the tradition by the outside world has now started giving birth to some wonderful artworks that can now be found all around the town works which are designed as much for the locals as they are for the outsiders. Interestingly enough, too, you don't find souvenir shops of the kind in Cagliari around here. You have to buy things like this by going to the museum. And if we go back to the question of exactly what's going on here, which I think is a key word in performance of any kind, what's going on here in terms of managing to keep a foot in both worlds, I think the methodology associated with performance studies does provide some answers. 
Now, clearly, the functions of what is going on in San Antonio, in the uh, San Antonio procession, vary greatly depending on exactly where you come from. And whether you are a performer from Mama Yaga or a tourist from the States. Over and above this, we have the question of time, place, background, association, all of which have particular importance and much greater depth for the local people. Greco underlines the huge difference, as you heard just now, the huge difference between performing outside the village, where he's essentially an actor, proud to represent his town and his country, and to show off what he does at home, and then when he performs at home, where the temporal, the geographical, the social framework is totally different. Here at Mamayada, being observed by tourists is a sideline when it comes down to it. The heart of what makes everything different, where when the, when the custom takes place here, at this particular place, at this particular time, is of course the element of tradition. Something that's not just about activity, but also about surroundings, participants, and time. About those people who preserve it for traditional reasons, underlining the importance of linking past and present. The date has long-term traditional associations, and the costumes are preserved and put on in traditional surroundings. The streets that you've danced on today have been trodden on the same day by other Mamatongas for decades, if not centuries. The mask you now wear belonged to one of these Mamatongas who was related to you by blood and DNA. The strong element here, I think, of what Eliade referred to back in the past as sacred time for the participants. As various writers have noted, this element of a simultaneous range of, of different levels of meaning lying above and below the modern San Antonio festival is, I think, particularly apparent if you note the participants involved in the small convivial gatherings that take place around the bonfires at the end of the celebrations in Mamayada on the 16th and 17th. Because these gatherings tend to involve only local people. They underline again the aspect of performance frameworks that I was talking about. As in, the, as in the masking traditions known throughout the North, the removal of the mask does mean reconnection with the community. And here, once the tourists have melted away, we are left with the core group for whom the day's performance has had quite a different meaning. When they sip their really excellent, rich local Kananau wine together around the fires, and they laugh and they converse in their local Sardinian dialect, they are stressing to each other the ties that continue to exist in a deeper bottom layer of unity, community, and communitas, a layer that can never be experienced by the tourists, and especially those who haven't visited the museum. Bearing this in mind, I think one can quite understand the statement given to Joris and Wall by one villager who said that when he dies, he hopes that he'll be buried as a Mama Thomas, wrapped in the tradition that's made him what he is, in other words, that underlined that he was an active, lifelong member of the village of Mamayaga. Thank you. So it's, it stays within families, definitely, and that, that you take on the role that was done by, by other people within your family before. And yes, you need to be trained to be able to do actually the, the dance and to follow exactly in time with everybody else. So there's a strong element of being trained. The same also, we have also nowadays children dressing up, and the idea is that they are being got ready to actually take part in the main celebrations. I think the, 
the, the guys who do this regularly every year, they, they don't need much preparation for it. So, but it is a matter of getting, getting everything ready. But most of it, as when we went to the headquarters ourselves, it is all ready at the moment. And it's looked up very, very carefully with a lot of respect by, by the local, by the local um, uh, associations. So yes, they don't, uh, those who are doing it uh, regularly, they don't need much preparation. Only, only with the issue of us. These, these, are the, these are the guys with the last suits. They're the ones who interact with other people. And they, as, as I mentioned, they deliberately, on the, on, on the 17th of January, nobody knows exactly what routes they're going to take. So this is, again, an answer to tourism. Um, that, that it's not meant for the tourists. Um, that they're allowed to look at it. But the, the Isua Torres lead the group in the direction they want to go. They just have to make sure that they get through all of the Bonfat within the town. Certainly, the sense is that you have to be being accepted into it. I don't know whether there's any particular rite that takes place, but there's a, it, everything about putting these masks on and being one of the one of the is it's seen taken very very seriously. Um, and uh, just somebody else can't just join. I, I asked, can I be a mammothomist? I've got an acting background and whatever else. Mm. Don't think so. Yeah. I think the religious part of it is not so much of any God, but the the idea of the tradition, um, which is why, in a sense, this, they, 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 it is important to them to stress in these 2,000 years of tradition, which nobody really knows about, but that they are doing something that is, is connecting very closely with the past, an ancient past, which they all want to stress. And the embodiment of it, taking it on, and that you want to be buried in this costume. Whether they'll be allowed to do that is another question. Um, but yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for a very stimulating talk. Um, I, I'm struck by a number of things that uh, you presented in terms of the parallels uh, in the research I've done on mass performance in West Africa. Yep. Um, and you made connections across Europe to the various yep. masking traditions uh, in your talk that Matt mentioned um, so the connection to the south, given that Sardinia is just not far from the, the shores of North Africa. I mean, it's, I've got a long list, and I'm not talking to you later, of, of very specific performative uh, processual elements that are very very identical. Um, so uh, a lot of things I'd like to talk to you about. I'm, I'm wondering if you thought about the connections to West Africa, A, and then B, um, hey, did people talk to you about the the sound, the role of sound in the performance at all, the, the, the bells or other aspects. You, you mentioned that they were mute, they did not actually a speaker sing. But I'm wondering if you could talk at all about the, the role of sound in any sense uh, in, in the ritual. Yeah. And then finally, um, are the, the, the individual masks are, are distinct and different, as you said, passed down to families. Do they have identity themselves, or do they believe to be? Do they have? Identities themselves, the, uh, specific things. No, no. Are they believed to be manifesting any other spirit or something of that nature? But each of these, are, uh, they're, they're, they're all, each one is different. Right. Um, but they're, they're, there are no characters. Okay. The, the, the idea is that they are that they're, they're all monotonous, and that there is no identity to them. But nonetheless, they each them knows that is their mask, and then one can see see just looking at the masks that they are. You can see that their hand. And can't. The, yes, these, these traditions, I would like to, our hope when we did the Nordic traditions was that people would follow it up with the Slavic traditions and then Germanic traditions to see, uh, we need to see how these things are connected. And then, of course, I think going further south um, would be very, very interesting all around. But I think there are certain common aspects, seasonal features, that one finds coming up, especially in the north. Uh, I, I decided of the of the of the, of the, of the shortest, shortest day of the year, especially around the turning of the season, um, because the, the, 
dates seem to go back, especially into to the idea of Halloween, beginning of winter, which in, in the northern parts of the world was the beginning of the year, as winter came first and then came summer later on. So I, I think it's a great to, to, to take a look also at African traditions going further south. But these years seem to be the, the strangely common features to what we're finding on the other side of the Alps. And I'm not sure where this has come from, I'm not going to make any conclusions. But it's that, it's that, that, that led me to, I wanted to know more about it. And then you have this odd jump to Skiros, um, which is clearly very, very similar. Um, I'm not going to make any conclusions, it's just intriguing. What about sound? Oh, sounds. Sorry. Nothing. Sorry. That's the, the, the key sound is the, the jumping and the bells, the, this clashing. But that, that, there's no communication spoken of any kind. And that's what also makes it so creepy. So we've got no face, no sound. And, and so there's the, the eyes, you can't see or you can see it in the background somewhere. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's creepy because of this. And it's almost military. Um, line. Some people have tried to connect it to the Saracens, but it, I don't know what well, we do today. But it's also about the, the meaning of the sound or, or the purpose of the sound? They say nothing. Some of them try to connect it to fertility, oh. uh, to, 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 to leaping on the ground and so on. But it is, it, it's spooky. Um, and you can understand why he talks about goose flesh. You're out there and these guys appear out of nowhere um, and say them. Which is what has got me out. I just incredible stuff. How does the community react to, to putting it on the international platform and changing the meaning of its services to start with? I'm going to use that so I can come a little bit closer. Take your mask off. So, uh, the community is a communal thing and then it is on an international platform. Right. So, we came up with the opinions of individuals about this. Right. I think that these, these individuals that I was talking to at least were examples of community people. And everybody, everybody that we spoke to when we were having our suckling pig, for example, and our wine, same sort of thing. That, that there is there's a great amount of pride in this. Um, and you see it in the way that, as I said, they're, that they're putting these art works up around the place, which they're proud of. And it's not just for the tourists. It's, it's a matter of expression. It's who we are. Um, so to, to me, it, it, it does, as I say, it, there seems to me that there's two levels going on at once. And you can see why they don't, as they said to me at the moment, they'd rather not be tied up with UNESCO. Because they're getting enough money in any way. And it lets them control it rather than it being fossilized in, a, uh, in some particular way by UNESCO. Which I think is an interesting movement, an interesting reaction to it. Anybody else? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Anybody else dying to ask something before we go? Yes. Okay. I love the return to Daniel's question about sound. Um, in particular, there have been interesting studies on the cosmology of these exact kind of shepherding bells in Eastern Europe, particularly in Bulgaria. And how the cosmology of those bells signal a lot of electrical festivals as well as the communal aspect. And the actual rhythm. 
is a great idea. That in a sense each of the bells together. As they mentioned themselves in the past, what they would do is go out and just take bells off the, off the sheep and the cows. And there was less harmony now. And now they're working more, now they've got some money to get better, better, better equipment. There's more of a sense of working towards harmony. So it wasn't so much that initially as just having the bells and the sound. So that's what, that's what I can say for that one. Okay, do you want to finish off? Thank you, Professor.